There was no magazine in which I or any of my friends could say what we thought was wrong with our education or the society in which we were being brought up. There was no magazine in which young photographers, artists, writers could express themselves freely. When you're 15, people don't take you seriously if you say you want to begin a national magazine. But I took myself very seriously indeed and decided to leave school and to do my best to start a national magazine for students. But I didn't want to go down to London empty-handed, so I covered myself by getting a lot of features and articles in before I left school. I realized that apart from student material, I needed interesting personalities to convince others that there was something in the idea. Robert Graves, Henry Moore, Scarf, Mugridge, Jean-Paul Sartre, Vanessa Redgrave, all helped in this way by sending in material. But it was a friendship I developed with two writers, Gavin Young and Gavin Maxwell, both of whom had left school early themselves, that gave me the final impetus when I was 16 to get out and get my education in the outside world. I moved into a one-room basement in London and with more than a little help from my friends, went after advertisers, making a mass of mistakes all the time. There was no money, but somehow the material came together and I managed to sell 5,000 pounds worth of advertising which was enough to cover both the printing and paper costs for 50,000 copies of the first issue. We sent it to press, and notwithstanding this rather painful lack of organization, the magazine sold well. W.H. Smith & Son had taken 50% of the copies. The remainder was sold entirely by young people and students throughout schools, universities and colleges in Britain. Three years later, things are different now in some respects, but they're still as informal. Max Handley joined us after the first issue and is a novelist too now. We hammer out the contents of the next issue between us and somehow put it together. People who visit us are often surprised to find how casual the atmosphere can seem at times. But everybody enjoys the lack of routine. The same staff that were here at the beginning still work full time in it, but 18 new people have joined us. Some have given up their formal education, like myself, to live and work on the magazine and other ventures. Um, and she lives at 20 other little villas. The editorial staff work long hours. They appreciate the importance of spending an enormous amount of time and effort on any one feature. Do you have their number or no. In the final stages of production, our art director, Robert Morley, comes in to work closely with us. We now have about £10,000 worth of advertising in issue and have doubled the number of pages. <laughs> do we want that one anymore, do we? No, no. I can tell we don't. What's this for? What's this for? for? I'm all lost. It's for the four-colour cover. A magazine that goes out to 100,000 young people. What are we going to do about fashion in the next issue? We got these pictures that we had left over from the last one. We used who, who are they by? I mean, there's, what, what is the whole point of fashion, anyway? I mean, they're, they're nice clothes exactly. and they're nice and that, that's girls why, and they're... That's, oh. that's why a student turns out to be glossy. It lacks the kind of, um, the guts that oh, it could have. That's true. You don't get oh, guts no. in a magazine by omitting fashion articles. No, exactly. No, but it creates, it creates pages. I mean, it's the principle of the thing. If we acted on the kind of principle that would make us cut fashion all through the magazine, I think you'd get a magazine worth reading. Oh, there's no... The contribution we're making through student is not our own personal opinion, but other people's often contradictory views on topics we think to be important. In meetings, we discuss which topics are important with people not working directly on the editorial side of the magazine. Recently, we have found that we are reaching a readership much wider than simply the student body. Each issue is now selling around 100,000 copies, many to non-students who find that there is no other serious critical magazine of this kind. And that's quite a reasonable thing not to write something like that. Whereas a professional that fashion photographer, you can give him his artistic freedom, if that's what you want to call it, and still get the photos at the end but of it. But there's no point giving artistic freedom because, you know, he's, he's already there. He's already on top of the world. And, you know, we're not that kind of magazine. Why shouldn't we just have um, pictures that people like to look at, pictures that girls want to go out and buy the clothes of, and do them much better than anybody else? I know it's not a particularly, exci it's not particularly exciting thing to do. Else. The distribution of student all takes place from the crypt of a church near Hyde Park. The first 50% of the magazines go straight to the bookstalls, W.H. Smith and Menzies. Now, um, you take one and six for every copy that you sell, and we take one and six. Well, there's no payment in advance or anything like that. All you do is take a certain number, shall we say 50, or maybe 100 for you because you're at Croydon. It'd be rather dry for you to keep coming up. 
We also try and have at least one contact in every university and school in the country who can take on between 50 and 1,000 magazines and sell them for us. If I could just have those cards back, and when you go, if you'd like to take the magazines, you take 100, and if you'd like to take 50, and when you've sold them, just contact us, you know, and send us back the money, okay? We also sell the magazine on the streets. In this way, we reach a large number of people who aren't at school or university and who don't buy from the bookstores. A lot of young people who can't get steady jobs elsewhere sell the magazine for us full time and manage to support themselves in this way. Excuse me, would you be interested in buying yeah. I like it um, because so many of these magazines you come across, uh, which are connected with students, are um, so sort of meaningless whereas, and destructive in one sense, whereas student magazine has something constructive to offer, certainly in, in facts, which it seems to have quite a lot of, and knowledge, and uh, obviously a lot of thoughts gone into it. You, you get the impression that they're just commercialising on this sort of outspokenness of all the issues going around today. I think the ideas of having um, people like John Trevelyan to give articles is a very good idea, but the way it's presented completely puts me off, and I think it will put most girls off. I think the design of it is quite good. I mean, it doesn't look like um, you know, something to wipe your bottom on. You know, it's a, it's a decently produced magazine, and I think it could be sold with a, with a completely different title to a much wider range of people. I think the contributors to this magazine are older, and um, which some people would think is, uh, means it isn't a student magazine at all. But um, these people, I think, have far more interesting things to say than a lot of students. It's very, very good. It's a little bit mannered, of course, but every student thing is a bit mannered. James Cameron, journalist. Certain aspects of the magazine is perhaps a little too ponderous for the student taste, but uh, I think that it's a magazine that anybody could be perfectly happy to subscribe to. Well, I think there are an awful lot of new ideas in magazines which start in universities and so on, and they don't get off the ground simply because they're not professionally run, and because they're just one point of view which shoots out of sight like a sort of shooting star, and that's the last year. Catherine Whitehorn, journalist. A student made a point from the beginning of putting two sides of a question. I was particularly impressed that he put two alternative points of view on Vietnam. Well, as you know, with the young, Vietnam is not a point of view. It's not something you do practically about. It's just an emotional noise that you show you're one of us by saying it. But he actually set out two opposing arguments on saying. I remember an interview he did with George Brown where George Brown kept saying, don't use this word student, it doesn't mean anything. It just means a group of people who are going through a process. It doesn't tell you anything about them. And all this was printed absolutely verbatim. I decided uh, not to risk launching the first issue of student unless we uh, had managed to get hold of enough cash uh, from advertising to cover both printing and paper costs and uh, staff costs and any other costs um, that you know, might ensue from the magazine. And I worked out that I'd had to get at least £4,000 worth of advertising um, before I'd have enough money to be able to you know, pay for all these bills. And set about and spent about six months selling advertising um, to you know, big firms throughout um, London, um, rushing around and collecting it in. And um, finally, when I um, got it together uh, and the editorial uh, material too, um, I got the art director to piece everything together and we went to press. Um, one amusing incident was the printers when they um, finally had got all the material at the um, at press and you know beginning to print um, found out that I was only 17 and 
um, decided that they uh, wouldn't go ahead and print after all. And it was then that I um, had my first dealings with my solicitors, um, and they forced them to go ahead and print the magazine, and um, fortunately managed to pay the bills uh, within a month afterwards, and um, that was that. One large feature in every issue of student is devoted to a social problem. For instance, a feature giving advice on all methods of contraception, on the symptoms of venereal disease, or a feature on mental problems, suicide or homosexuality. In this way, we hope to help those of our readers who have been ignored by their teachers, parents and doctors. As a result of these features, we had a mass of letters requesting help of one sort or another. So I set up a center that could deal with the problems of young people their legal, social, psychological, and educational difficulties. Young people throughout universities, colleges, schools, distributed Give Us Your Headaches leaflets. Articles appeared in the press, the radio took it up, and soon we were receiving about 500 calls a week. The advisory centre came as a result of my own mistake in making my own girlfriend pregnant. Um, and I went through about three months of um, hell, or torment, or whatever you say, in trying to find um, somebody who could give us help. Um, and I was very lucky then that, you know, when she was nearly three months pregnant, um, we finally came across a very kind woman doctor who in fact helped a lot in the advisory centre since. Um, and as a result of um, my own personal um, experience, um, and perhaps of the experience when I first came down to London of not knowing anyone and going through a period of about a month of loneliness in the basement, and, um, you know, I decided to um, set up a centre um, which dealt with problems or any problems of young people um, and collected together about uh, 60 or 70 top doctors and psychiatrists throughout London and then throughout the rest of the country who um, said that they would be able to give up say an afternoon a week in helping free um, with the problems of people who came to us. I found your telephone number in a phone booth in a Chinese restaurant on Piccadilly Circus <laughs> and uh, I was wondering if you could help me. I'd like to find an agency that will help me with the adoption of my child. We at the centre do not attempt to deal with any complex problem. Young people generally come to us because they just do not know where to go or where is best to go. Right, what's worrying you? Well, I suppose it's an educational problem, basically. I, I did my O-levels at school and I started to do my O-levels. I did a term, but then I thought, packed it in because the school was so foul. And um, I've been working now on and off for three years. They know they can contact us 24 hours a day and be told who the expert is for their particular problem. And it's up to us to talk to them sympathetically and know where best to send them. It's very difficult. Um, the you know, government's been discussing six form grants for years and years and years. Basically, it's a money problem. Um, I've got a conditional place at university this coming October, and um, I'm having a great deal of trouble with my grant. My mother's a widow, and uh, she can't cope with the bureaucracy and the form filling that she has to do in order for me... The only problems which are dealt with at the centre and not referred on are practical problems such as accommodation, jobs and loneliness. We get a lot of calls from people who are depressed, who haven't had the opportunity to meet other people of their age or who have difficulty getting on with others. Many have no specific problems but need guidance as to what they should be doing. In fact, often they just need someone to talk to. Yes, they sent me the forms and uh, you know, we have filled them out. So really, I came along in the hope that if you pleaded my case as well, I mean, I'll continue, but if you pleaded my case as well, I'd have some kind of an official body backing me. So um, they'd have to take a bit more notice of me. How long are you with you now? 10 weeks. Some of the problems are more serious. This girl wants an abortion, and our function is simply to refer her immediately onto a medically approved clinic. Well, my periods are so irregular that uh, this was the first opportunity that I really had to, you know, to be able to find out. Okay. Um, well, look, what we'll do, um, it's a very, very simple, easy operation if you want an abortion, which we presume you do. Um, we'll arrange it um, for you in Birmingham, which is the very mm -hmm. kind people, very good people who are helping there. Um, and as long as it's done by good doctors and a good nursing home, you've got absolutely nothing to worry about. Um, After I'd seen her, this particular girl went to the Birmingham Pregnancy Advisory Centre and was given a thorough examination by a qualified doctor. Really terrible. Uh -huh. You had some sickness. Sick. Yes. Um, you, uh, is this just in the morning or evening? Or do you no, it's all day. All day, yeah. And um, uh, have you noticed any other changes? Well, my breasts are swollen very much. Yes. 
And, um, we leave it to their doctors to make the final decision as to whether a girl should or should not have her pregnancy um, terminated. Have you tried to do anything yourself to, to induce an abortion, to bring on your periods? Oh, God, there's no point, is there? No, you're quite right, of course. A lot of people do, though. Um, now, were you using any, any form of contraceptive? No, no. Was there any particular reason for this? I mean, have you been having intercourse for long? Yes, for, for a long time, but uh, well, I, was, I didn't want to take the pill because I'd heard so much about it, thrombosis and so on. You were frightened of it? Yes, I was, yes. yes. You know what the risk is, don't you? It's about one in three million. It's very, very slight. You might be struck by lightning, you know, more likely. Students, like most other young people, find themselves with problems about birth control, and they're not, in this sense, a very privileged... Helen Graham, Family Planning Association. People. They may have student advisory services in their colleges, but many of them don't want to give advice on birth control, and some of the doctors in the student health services do have rather rigid ideas about this and many young students are intimidated by the idea that they may go and see their student health advisory doctor um, who may read them the riot act and tell them they shouldn't do it so it's enormously helpful we think uh, for students to have a service to which they can go and be explain their problem and be referred to a family planning clinic and know that nobody is going to say when well, you're not doing the right kind of thing you know and, and really you know you're a naughty girl you ought to go away and think again before you do it uh, i think there's a very definite need for this sort of center uh, a doctor the from the birmingham pregnancy have, advisory center uh, such surveys as have been conducted amongst the late adolescent population indicates that a considerable proportion of them uh, are in difficulty and trouble of various types, um, psychological, emotional, personality problems, problems with relationships, growing up problems and so on. And unfortunately, the National Health Service is not particularly well equipped to cope with them. And in consequence, um, a centre such as this uh, which puts the people with the problems in contact with the experts who can help and solve the problems, uh, I think is uh, making a very worthwhile contribution. The difficulties that students have are very real. A lot of people think that students these days, you know, they get a nice grant and go to college and everything in the garden is lovely, but it isn't so. They do have a lot of problems and not enough care or thought is being given to these... Doreen Cordell, the Albany Trust. And Richard, by attracting people who have any kind of worry at all um, and sorting them out and referring on those with psychosexual difficulties of any kind into us and to other agencies um, is doing a real service in, in helping to get them into a state of serenity and into... Um, a receptive frame of mind to be able to make best use of their studies. We soon realised that you know, if you could have a centre in England uh, which was dealing with so many young people, um, a place like France um, where there, there wasn't a centre, or a place like America where there weren't, wasn't a centre, um, would be an ideal place to set one up. And rather than um, spending hours sort of planning it, we decided just to send three people to France um, with you know, details of the advisory centre and everything. Um, and to try to get a building or some financial backing from somebody in France to set it going. Uh, they arrived in France and within a matter of two days were arrested and um, sent back to England. Um, so we realised that we'd gone about it the wrong way and we had to then approach Scotland Yard and get Scotland Yard to approach the French police. And after about two months we managed to set it up an official constitution, as they call it in France, um, and get the advisory centre going in France. Um, and we then um, were approached by an American organization who'd seen an article in Newsweek about us um, to see if they could help us um, set it one up in um, America. And um, so in conjunction with the, um, the Philadelphian Psychiatric Institution, um, we bought a farm in um, Philadelphia, or they bought a farm, and they um, set up the advisory center on the same lines as ours. Yeah. Well, we deal with all sorts of problems, um, not merely, not mainly educational ones. Sometimes they're all bound up together. Often, foreign students are lonely or upset and have nowhere to go, etc., etc. And so, it might be very useful to us on a lot of grounds if we could, could have something. A development of the advisory centre was the nurses' union. The idea of this was to help nurses practically. 
giving them extra work, discussing their problems with them, trying to get them a pay rise. And she's got four children. Um, four, six, eight, and nine. Um, she just wants someone to take vacation, you know, to take vacation visits to the zoo. We used to have uh, nurses coming to the advisory centre for help. Um, I can remember one or two specific people who came um, who just didn't have enough money to clothe themselves properly or to live up to the standards they used to live up to um, before they became nurses. They um, were ashamed of going out with their boyfriends because um, of you know lack of um, good clothes and they would shut themselves up in their room at night time. Um, they couldn't get good meals and they were underfed and, and I mean it literally was just about this bad. And so we decided to set up an organisation that first of all um, helped try to get increases of pay through the you know, government channels. Um, secondly, um, practically helped them in getting them extra work such as babysitting which is quite easy work and that they can relax in front of a television and look after a baby generally. These are some nurses who have been helped by the union. Well, I've done mostly evening jobs and also a couple of just ordinary charring jobs, housework, for a, um, a couple of evenings. These people who either their flats have gotten a terrible mess and they want them cleaned up quickly and this sort of thing. When I was um, hard up last winter, I managed to live on my babysitting money for about a month and save my wages. And it was really good, especially with Christmas coming on. Helped. It's nice to have um, sort of young people behind you to feel that they're sort of supporting you, and especially you know promoting nurses, and they do work for other young people as well. I think. The nurses Union loses. Um, well, we've lost, I suppose, about seven hundred and fifty to a thousand pounds in a matter of about um, four or five months, mainly from advertising and telephone bills and staff costs. In fact, we might have lost a bit more than that. Um, Therefore, um, you know, we have to use the advisory centre, um, sorry, use the magazine um, and um, to sort of finance it. And the reason I began Virgin Records was to try to get some more cash to finance the Nurses Union and the advisory centre. And the We worked out that there was no need for shops to be charging the amount they were for records, so we started a mail order company that would sell any record from any record manufacturer for 10% to 25% less than the commercial price. For instance, we could buy a record from EMI for 31 shillings, which a shop would sell at 40 shillings. Instead, we sell it for 35 shillings. Inquiries, please. Yeah, can you tell me the catalogue number of an old uh, Buffalo Springfield record, um, retrospective, it's called? Of our four shilling profit, two shilling goes immediately on packaging and posting, and the other two shillings is spread over staff costs and advertising in the major record papers. However, even on this small margin, we are able to make a good enough profit to keep the advisory centre going and to expand Virgin Records. Um, fresh cream. It's 594001, uh, déjà vu, I like 50, <coughs> uh, 2401001. Within a month, we were selling four to 5,000 records a week, and I decided that we had enough money to promote the company further and start a recording studio. I'd like 30 of those, please. Virgin Records is helping hundreds and hundreds of um, young people throughout the country to get records at about six shillings cheaper than, or six to eight shillings cheaper than they would anywhere else. Um, at the same time, uh, it's also starting up new groups who, uh, you know, have been scorned by some of the big companies and were, you know, listening to their records and, get, and to give them a chance to get going themselves. We want to help the many very talented young and not so young people who have valid things to say musically but who are ignored by the commercially minded big companies. Uh, how many are else are there of you in the group? Well, basically there's five. Some numbers we prefer to keep simple. Maybe just the guitar. They tend to pander, understandably perhaps, to the more lucrative side of the pop world, whereas we hope that we can create an informal atmosphere 
completely free from the destructive tensions caused by the hard sell attitude of the big companies, while still making a profit. Being independent, one of the major advantages we have is that we can make policy decisions quickly. If we want to produce a record, we don't have to have a mass of meetings. We can immediately say, yes, let's go ahead and produce it. If we want to build up a publishing company or open a record shop, we can try our hand at that too. The, the idea appeals to me a lot because I, I much prefer working with a, a small organisation that you really, you on close terms with everybody and you mm. know they're going to work hard behind you. Having a yearly turnover of £100,000 for student and £200,000 for Virgin Records helps us do what we want in the way we want. We all work here because we enjoy the work and believe that we can be happy and work at the same time without feeling obliged to turn up for work every morning at, say, 9.30. We all work when we want to and how we want to and yet still manage to make enough money to be economically free. I could well have been one of those sort of students who um, waffled around and um, didn't do things if I, um, because I wasn't interested in doing um, what was open to me. It's just that I was lucky enough at the age of 15 to become one track mind and had an idea that I thought um, was an idea that might have worked. I mean, I never foresaw myself, um, you know, sitting in front of the television cameras or anything as a result of the idea, but it was an idea that I felt was very important um, and developed the idea and, and it became a successful idea and that, that was all. Um, but I could well have been an, an ordinary student who, um, you know, who, who have had a difficulty getting a job, but most likely they will find jobs that, you know, they'll be happy in later on in life, whereas I've just been um, fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to find it early on in life. I welcome a student because um, it raises issues that seem to me to be ignored by conventional publishing. It is addressed to youth. It uh, does seek in a general sense to uh, be wanting not necessarily the means of life but also the purpose of life. I mean, there is a, a pervading theme that life must have some sort of purpose. I think perhaps this is what earns him the respect of a much wider group than a lot of students, is that they are constantly recommending that the world should be put right in this, that and the other way, and that one should do so and so. And it's left to somebody like Richard to get on and actually run their own show and do it, not just say how it might be done. And I think this is really the difference between student and the funny little university magazines that spring up like mushrooms all the time. I mean, they're always printed in laboratory paper in lower case and they've got silly little gimmicks or they're bound up with garters or something. His is a totally professional job because he's not interested in being experimental for, his own for its own sake. He's just going ahead and doing what he wants to do. And I get the feeling that in the student world they all talk about doing their own thing, but very often they're waiting for somebody else to do it for them.